poem is called Beautiful Ohio. And it begins with those old Winnebago men knew what they were singing all summer and all along. I taught this poem in a class about six, seven years ago, and my students were to write in response to some of the poems, and several of the students thought these were senior citizens with <laughs> recreational vehicles. <laughs> so we had to go back over that. <laughs> Beautiful Ohio. Those old Winnebago men knew what they were singing all summer long and all along. I had found a way to sit on a railroad tie above the sewer main. It spilled a shining waterfall out of a pipe somebody had gouged through the slanted earth. 16,500 more or less people in Martin's Ferry, my home, my native country, quickened the river with the speed of light, and the light caught there the solid speed of their lives in the instant of that waterfall. I know what we call it most of the time, but I have my own song for it, and sometimes, even today, I call it beauty. Uh, <clears throat> this is from the Green Wall, uh, and I think it's un an unusual poem, uh, it's a sort of sonnet-sized poem, uh, in the Green Wall because it anticipates uh, much of what will follow uh, after the branch will not break. It's, um, I think it's figuring an archetype, you'll see that. It's called Father. In paradise, I poised my foot above the boat and said, who prayed for me? But only the dip of an oar in water sounded, slowly fog from some cold shore circled in wreaths around my head. But who was waiting? And the wind began transfiguring my face from nothingness to tiny weeping eyes. And when my voice grew real, there was a place far, far below on earth. There was a tiny man. It was my father, wandering round the waters at the wharf. Irritably he circled, and he called out to the marine currents, up and down, but heard only a cold, unmeaning cough, and saw the oarsman in the mist, in shawls. He drew me from the boat. I was asleep, and we went home together. <coughs> I mentioned this as a favorite poem earlier, and it's one that only becomes closer to me the more often I read it. Um, I mentioned that there's something about this poem. It was perhaps the first poem of James Wright's that I read uh, at Cornell University. I had a teacher who was listening to us on the first day of class read our own poems, and he diagnostically pointed to each student and instructed us to go to the library. <laughs> and um, after hearing me read a poem on that first day of class, his, his name was Thomas Johnson, he was a wonderful poet, still, still very much alive, and um, he said, have you ever heard of James Wright? Go, go to the library and, and get his book, The Branch Will Not Break. This is the first poem in that collection. And uh, it has an epigraph from Pachui, uh, it was translated by the great translator Arthur Whaley. Uh, many, many of us heard our first Chinese translations in his voice. And how can I, born in evil days and fresh from failure, ask a kindness of fate? Written A.D. 819. As I step over a puddle at the end of winter, 
I think of an ancient Chinese governor. Bachui, balding old politician, what's the use? I think of you uneasily entering the gorges of the Yangtze when you were being towed up the rapids towards some political job or other in the city of Chungxiao. You made it, I guess, by dark. But it is 1960, it is almost <coughs> spring again, and the tall rocks of Minneapolis build me my own black twilight of bamboo ropes and waters. Where is Yuan Chen, the friend you loved? Where is the sea that once solved the whole loneliness of the Midwest? Where is Minneapolis? I can see nothing but the great terrible oak tree darkening with winter. Did you find the city of isolated men beyond mountains? Or have you been holding the end of a frayed rope for a thousand years? Northern Pike. All right, try this then. Everybody I know and care for, and everybody else is going to die in a loneliness I can't imagine and a pain I don't know. We had to go on living. We untangled the net. We slit the body of this fish open from the hinge of the tail to a place beneath the chin I wish I could sing of. I would just as soon we let the living go on living. An old poet whom we believe in said the same thing. And so we paused among the dark cattails and prayed for the muskrats, for the ripples beneath their tails, for the little movements that we knew the crawdads were making underwater, for the right-hand wrist of my cousin who was a policeman. We prayed for the game warden's blindness. We prayed for the road home. We ate the fish. There must be something very beautiful in my body. I am so happy. I can't remember. Shall we, shall we gather at the river? Shall we gather at the river? The poem is called Speak. To speak in a flat voice is all that I can do. I have gone every place asking for you, wondering where to turn and how the search would end, and the last street light spin above me blind. Then I returned rebuffed and saw under the sun the race not to the swift, nor the battle <coughs> won. Liston dives in the tank. Lord in Lewiston, Maine, and Ernie Doty's drunk in hell again. And Jenny, oh my Jenny, whom I love, rhyme be damned, has broken her spare beauty in a whorehouse old. She left her new baby in a bus station can and sprightly danced away through Jackson Town, which is a place I know, one where I got picked up a few shrunk years ago by a good cop. Believe it, Lord, or not, don't ask me who he was. I speak of flat defeat in a flat voice. I have gone forward with some a few lonely some. They have fallen to death. I die with them. Lord, I have loved thy cursed, the beauty of thy house. Come down, come down. Why dost thou hide thy face? This is the branch will not break. Uh, reviewers of that book pointed uh, to this particular poem uh, unhappy reviewers, I might add, and uh, <laughs> felt that the last line, which is now famous, Annie was quoting it uh, uh, a little while ago, as uh, unearned and unprepared for. 
the reviewer was making two mistakes. Um, first of all, he hadn't apparently read uh, uh, Rilke's uh, Archaic Force of Apollo. Uh, and the other is that he didn't quite get the sentence that Wright was writing. And the sentence is this, lying in a hammock at William Duffy's farm in Pine Island, Minnesota, comma, I have wasted my life. That's the sentence. And he filled the rest in. Over my head, I see the bronze butterfly asleep on the black trunk, glowing like a leaf in green shadow. Down the ravine behind the empty house, the cowbells follow one another into the distances of the afternoon. To my right, in a field of sunlight between two pines, the droppings of last year's horses blaze up into golden stones. I lean back as the evening darkens and comes on a chicken hawk floats over, looking for home. I have wasted my life. That uh, home, uh, and that next to last line, I think is the key to I have wasted my life. So, mm -hmm. <coughs> The title poem of St. Judas is the last poem in St. Judas, and um, for me one of the most beautiful. Um, this, this poem, along with Autumn Begins in Martin's Ferry, Ohio, really um, influenced my own sense of what it was to try to um, write myth about a place, but also write one's own sense of, of place and self into myth, and so this is St. This is Judas. When I went out to kill myself, I caught a pack of hoodlums beating up a man. Running to spare his suffering, I forgot my name, my number, how my day began, how soldiers milled around the garden stone and sang amusing songs, how all that day their javelins measured crowds, how I alone bargained the proper coins and <coughs> slipped away. Banished from heaven, I found this victim beaten, stripped, kneed, and left to cry. Dropping my rope aside, I ran, ignored the uniforms. Then I remembered bread my flesh had eaten, the kiss that ate my flesh. Flayed without hope, I held the man for nothing in my arms. <coughs> I can't resist saying that, that that poem is not only a sonnet, but it's also a dramatic monologue. It's, it's kind, of, kind of astonishing that he does both things, and it's probably his, his most uh, clear tribute to uh, Edwin Arlington Robinson, we were talking about mm -hmm. before. Um, this is a poem that Annie Wright and I were talking about just recently, and, and I haven't read it in a long while, so please Forgive me if I don't get this exactly right. But it was one of the poems that, that obsessed James Wright in the last <clears throat> seven or eight years of his life. It appears in his posthumous volume, and it's, it's an elegy. Um, one of the early interviews I did for my book was with Stanley Plumley, And Stanley um, introduced me to the concept of a love poem elegy. It's a kind of form that James Wright invented, and you can trace this through a great many of his poems, and this is one of those examples of uh, something very important, a, 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 str a strain of poems in, in Wright's work that, that Stan Plumley has, has pointed out. And it's called A Flower Passage in memory here in the book, it's called Joe Shank the Diver. His name was John Shunk, correct? And uh, 
he's buried in the cemetery up in the Weeks Cemetery, not far from uh, James's beloved grandmother. Who's, uh, but um, John Shunk was the the man they called to uh, drag the bodies out of the river when when boys. Uh, were drowned in suck holes in the river, and, and he became a kind of mysterious presence to uh, the, the, the people of Martin's Ferry. It's called A Flower Passage. Even if you were above the ground this year, you would not know my face. One of the small boys, one of the briefly green, I prowled with the others along the Ohio, raised hell in the B&O boxcars after dark, and sometimes in the evening, chawed the knots out of my trousers on the river bank, while the other children of blast furnace and mine fought and sang in the channel current, daring the Ohio. Shepherd of the dead, one of the tall men, I did not know your face. One summer, dog day after another, you rose and gathered your gear and slogged downhill of the river ditch to dive into the blind channel. You dragged your hooks all over the rubble sludge and lifted the 12-year bones. Now you are dead and turned over to the appropriate authorities. Christ, have mercy on me. I would have come to the funeral home if I were home in Martins Ferry, Ohio. I would bring to your still face a dozen modest and gaudy carnations. But I am not home in my place where I was born and my friends drowned. So I dream of you morning. I walk down the B&O track near the sewer main. And there I gather, and here I gather, the flowers I only know best. The spring leaves of the sumac stink only a little worse, a little less worse than the sewer main. And up above the gouged hill, where somebody half crazy tossed a cigarette straight down into a pile of sawdust in the heart of the LaBelle Lumber Company, there on the blank mill field, it is the blind and tough fireweeds I gather and bring home. To you, for my drowned friends, I offer the true sumac and the foul trillium whose varicose bloom swells the soil with its bruise. And a little later, I bring the still totally unbelievable spring beauty that for some hidden reason nobody raped to death in Ohio. I intimately refer to James Wright, among many other things, as an Appalachian poet. And there are um, dangers, of course, in any kind of categorization. But I did want to say a couple more things about that. If you read other poets from the region, you will discover that what Wright has in common with them is a precise and accurate attention to the natural world to plants and weeds, little animals, small insects. You also find a sense of history, not only family history, but national history, world history, what happened in the past. You'll also find a use of language that is part syntactical, part dialectical, and part folk, folk expressions. And you'll find, of course, the spirituality, shall we gather at the river. And you'll find a sense of outsiderness, a sense of marginality, of not being quite a part of the mainstream. And you'll also find the naming of specific places. It's important to say where you are, Bridgeport, Wheeling, Rochester, Minnesota, Sermione, Pisa. This poem is called Honey. It's from the final uh, posthumous volume, This Journey. And it does use a, a folk expression. It does use some, some Appalachian syntactical digressions. And it tells a story. It is one of the prose pieces, I guess I should say that. 
Honey, my father died at the age of 80. One of the last things he did in his life was to call his 58-year-old son-in-law Honey. One afternoon in the early 1930s, when I bloodied my head by pitching over a wall at the bottom of a hill and believed that the mere sight of my own blood was the tragic meaning of life, I heard my father offer to murder his future son-in-law. His son-in-law is my brother. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry. His son-in-law is my brother-in-law, whose name is Paul. These two grown men rose above me and knew that a human life is murder. They weren't fighting about Paul's love for my sister. They were fighting with each other because one strong man, a factory worker, was laid off from his work, and the other strong man, the driver of a coal truck, was laid off from his work. They were both determined to live their lives and so they glared at each other and said they were going to live, come hell or high water. High water is not trite in southern Ohio. <laughs> Nothing is trite along a river. My father died a good death. To die a good death means to live one's life. I don't say a good life. I say a life. My first visit to Martin's Ferry in 1981, for when the festival was getting started, was to wander around town and uh, uh, just to check in on uh, Wright's uh, journalism, so to speak. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and lo and behold, I was so happy to find the uh, WPA swimming pool with a wonderful plaque outside. <laughs> The old WPA swimming pool in Martins Ferry, Ohio. I am almost afraid to write down this thing. I must have been, say, seven years old. That afternoon, the families of the WPA had come out to have a good time celebrating a long gouge in the ground that had the fierce husbands filling with concrete. We knew even then the Ohio River was dying. Most of the good men who lived along that shore wanted to be in love and give good love to beautiful women who weren't pretty. And to small children like me who wondered, what the hell is this? When people don't have quite enough to eat in August and the river that is supposed to be some holiness starts dying, they swim in the earth. Uncle Sherman, Uncle Willie, Uncle Emerson, and my father helped dig that hole in the ground. <coughs> I had seen by that time two or three holes in the ground, and you know what they were. But this one was not the usual cheap economics. It was not the solitary scar on a poor man's face, that respectable hole in the ground you used to be able to buy after you died for $75 and your wages attached for six months by the Heslop brothers. <laughs> brothers, dear God. No, this hole was filled with water, and suddenly I flung myself into the water. All I had on was a jock strap my brother stole from a miserable football team. <laughs> oh, never mind. Jesus Christ, my father and my uncles <coughs> dug a hole in the ground. No grave for once. It is going to be hard for you to believe. When I rose from that water, a little girl who belonged to somebody else, a face thin and haunted, appeared over my left shoulder and whispered, Take care now. Be patient and live. I have loved you all this time and didn't even know.
I'm going to read a poem called Trying to Pray so that when I rip off a line from it in my reading later on, you know that, I'm, that, I've, that I've at least, I have witnesses that I, it's cited. <laughs> MLA format and everything. <laughs> Trying to Pray. This time, I have left my body behind me, crying in its dark thorns. Still, there are good things in this world. It is dusk. It is the good darkness of women's hands that touch loaves. The spirit of a tree begins to move. I touch leaves. I close my eyes and think of water. Exactly a month to the day before James Wright passed away in New York City, the New Yorker published what is, in a sense, the title poem for what became his posthumous collection. And the first time I heard this poem was the day that James Wright died, and a friend of mine, Fran Quinn, phoned me and read me this poem over the phone. This is called The Journey. And Gyori is medieval a sleeve sloping down a steep hill, suddenly sweeping out to the edge of a cliff and dwindling. But far up the mountain, behind the town, we too were swept out, out by the wind, alone with the Tuscan grass. Wind had been blowing across the hills for days, and everything now was graying gold with dust. Everything we saw, even some small children scampering along a road twittering Italian to a small caged bird. We sat beside them to rest in some brushwood, and I leaned down to rinse the dust from my face. I found the spider web there whose hinges reeled heavily and crazily with the dust, whole mounds and cemeteries of it sagging and scattering shadows among shells and wings. And then she stepped into the center of air, slender and fastidious, the golden hair of daylight along her shoulders. She poised there, while ruins crumbled on every side of her, free of the dust, as though a moment before she had stepped inside the earth to bathe herself. I gazed close to her till at last she stepped away in her own good time. Many men have searched all over Tuscany and never found what I found there, the heart of the light, itself shelled and leaved, balancing on filaments themselves falling. The secret of this journey is to let the wind blow its dust all over your body, to let it go on blowing, to step lightly lightly, all the way through your ruins, and not to lose any sleep over the dead who surely will bury their own. Don't worry. First poem into a blossoming pear tree. Red wings. Um, red wings love to hang out, by the way, in you know, uh, their ponds and soft rivers. I think they're the greatest American birds. They're incredible uh, in their simple beauty and eccentric beauty. Make a wonderful kind of sound. They don't really sing. That's the wonderful. They sound like computers getting warmed up. <laughs> <coughs> it turns out you can kill them. It turns out you can make the earth absolutely clean. My nephew has given my younger <coughs> brother a scientific report while they both flew in my older brother's small airplane over the Pusongin River that looks secret. It looks like the open scar turning gray 
on the small of your spine. Can you hear me? It was only in the evening I saw a few red wings come out and dip their brilliant yellow bills in their scarlet shoulders. Ohio was already going to hell, but sometimes they would sit down on the creosote soaked pasture fence posts. They used to be few. They used to be willowy and thin. One afternoon along the Ohio where the sewer poured out, I found a nest the way they build their nests in the reeds, so beautiful, red wings and solitaries. The skinny girl I fell in love with down home in late autumn married a strip miner in late autumn. Her five children are still alive, floating near the river. Somebody is on the wing. Somebody is wandering right at this moment how to get rid of us while we sleep. Together among the dead gorges of highway construction, we flare across highways and drive motorists crazy. We fly down home to the river. There one summer evening, a dirty man gave me a nickel and a potato and fell asleep by a fire. <coughs> one of the Folks of James Wright that got the most mixed reception, so to speak, was the book called Two Citizens. It was a book, in fact, that Wright later, as Jonathan reports in the biography, um, felt he shouldn't have published. Um, to me, there's a, an important move in that book that is as important as the shift that began with The Branch Shall Not Break and that is letting out more of the dialectical and the, um, I don't know exactly what the word is, but I guess the, the anger and the love that he had for his people and this place. And he calls it Ars Poetica, some recent criticism, which I think is interesting because it sort of is declaring that this is how you write poems, right? This is uh, an Ars Poetica. It's in several sections. One, I loved my country when I was a little boy. Agnes is my aunt, and she doesn't even know if I love anything on this God's green little apple. I have no idea why Uncle Sherman, who is dead, fell in with her. He wasn't all that drunk. <laughs> he longed all life long to open a package store, and he never did anything. But he fell in with Agnes. She is no more to me than my mind is, which I bless. She was a homely woman in the snow, alone. Sherman sang bad, but he could sing. I, too, have fallen in with a luminous woman. It must be something. The only bright thing Agnes ever did that I know of was to get hurt and angry when Sherman met my other uncle, Emerson Buchanan, who thinks he is not dead. At the wedding of Agnes, Uncle Emerson smirked. What's the use buying a cow when you can get the milk free? She didn't weep. She got mad. Mad means something. You guys are making fun out of me. Two. She stank. Her house stank. I went down to see Uncle Sherman one evening. I had a lonely furlough out of the army. He must have been one of the heroes of love because he lay down with my Aunt Agnes twice, at least. Listen, lay down there, even when she went crazy. She wept two weeping daughters, but she did not cry. I think she was too lonely to weep for herself. Three, I gather my Aunt Agnes into my veins. I could tell you if you have read this far 
that the nut house in Cambridge where Agnes is dying is no more Harvard than you could ever be. <laughs> and I want to gather you back to my Ohio. You can understand Aunt Agnes, sick, her eyes blackened, her one love dead. Four, why do I care for her, that slob so fat and stupid? One afternoon at Etnaville, Ohio, a broken goat escaped from a carnival, one of the hooch dances they used to hold down by my river. Scrawny, the goat panicked down Agnes's alley, which is my country, if you haven't noticed, America, which I loved when I was young. Five. That goat ran down the alley and many boys giggled while they tried to stone our fellow goat to death. And my Aunt Agnes, who stank and lied, threw stones back at the boys and gathered the goat nuts as she was, into her sloppy arms. Six, reader, we had a lovely language. We would not listen. I don't believe in your God. I don't believe my Aunt Agnes is a saint. I don't believe the little boys who stoned the poor son of a bitch goat are charming Tom Sawyers. I don't believe in the goat either. Seven, when I was a boy, I loved my country. Ensipetit placidum sublibertate quietum. Hell, I ain't got nothing. Oh, you bastards, how I hate you. In response to a rumor that the oldest whorehouse in Wheeling, West Virginia has been condemned. I will grieve alone as I strolled alone years ago down along the Ohio shore. I hid in the hobo jungle weeds upstream from the sewer main, pondering, gazing. I saw downriver at 23rd and Water Streets by the vinegar works the doors open in early evening. Swinging their purses, the women poured down the long street to the river and into the river. I do not know how it was they could drown every evening. <laughs> what time near dawn did they climb up the other shore, drying their wings? For the river at Wheeling, West Virginia has only two shores, the one in hell, the other in Bridgeport, Ohio. <laughs> and nobody would commit suicide only to find beyond death Bridgeport, Ohio. <laughs> uh, this, this poem is called Milkweed and it has surrounding it uh, some of the most famous James Wright poems, A Blessing and some others, but I want to read this one. So I will. <laughs> Milkweed. While I stood here in the open, lost to myself, I must have looked a long time down the cor corn rows, beyond grass, the small house, white walls, animals lumbering toward the barn. I look down now. It is all changed. Whatever it was I lost, whatever I wept for, was a wild, gentle thing, the small, dark eyes loving me in secret. It is here, at a touch of my hand. The air fills with delicate creatures from the other world. 